Some of us um, were involved in proposing the idea of advanced market commitments for vaccines in the early 2000s. And we helped um, design an advanced market commitment for pneumococcus, uh, which is a leading cause of child mortality. And that focused on trying to create incentives for the development of a vaccine that would cover the strains common in developing countries. Um, and, and also to help, help, uh, help make sure that that was, uh, could, would be affordable once it was developed. And that program was, was funded. Um, several of us were you know, highly involved in the design. And two vaccines have been developed um, and have now saved an estimated 700,000 lives. Um, so when this pandemic came around, uh, it was approached by policymakers who were asking, could we establish similar advanced market commitments for COVID-19 vaccines? And you know, thinking about it quickly, I realized there were some similarities, but also some differences. We reached out to you know, leading experts like Susan and others, and we established an informal group called Accelerating Health Technologies with Incentive Design. Think about the financing of health technology for COVID-19 um, and help expedite the development of vaccines and drug treatments. Um, so we've been advising governments in the US and, and abroad uh, throughout the pandemic. And today I'd like to talk about the working paper that was circulated, but I also want to, we'll say, a, we'll also say a little bit of two other papers that are in progress. Um, one covers uh, you know, similar issues of how to uh, stimulate production of vaccines. Another one is, is thinking about how can we get more out of the existing supply of vaccines. Those two other papers aren't quite ready, but I, I hope they'll be, uh, be ready soon. Let's start out by saying a little bit about Biden's plan. Um, you know, th this is pushing on many fronts, uh, vaccine delivery, vaccine production, testing, masks, investing in clinical trial for repurposed therapeutics, you know, I think that's broadly very, very appropriate. Our work is focused on vaccines. Um, and there I'd note that investments in production and delivery are, are complements. Uh, vaccines are, are more valuable if we can, the faster we can get the flu shots in the, sorry, get the shots in arms. Um, but I think we can, I think um, we can do a lot more to accelerate vaccination. And just to give a sense of how important speed is, um, if we could, if the U.S. could increase the rate of vaccination from 1 million per day to 2 million per day, um, rough calculations suggest we'd prevent 20 to 35 percent of future COVID-19 infections and 15 to 20 percent of future deaths. We think about this from a global perspective and adding in the, the economic perspective. Every month, uh, the world is losing $500 billion in short-run GDP alone. If you take a more comprehensive measure of harm um, that includes long-run health costs, costs in education, uh, you get much, much bigger numbers. So Cutler and Summers, just for the U.S., estimate $800 billion each month uh, for the U.S. alone. That, that, they, it's actually $16 trillion over a longer period, but if you convert it to monthly, it's $800 billion a month. So that suggests that if we can Given those huge monthly costs, the social benefit of expanding manufacturing capacity and delivery capacity is immense. Um, and that's really you know, the, the starting observation for our analysis and the analysis in this paper. You know, the time to complete vaccination is just the total population to be vaccinated, or whatever that is, divided by the, the capacity um, per in, you know, the annual capacity or monthly capacity. And that that means that the putting in more capacity, putting capacity early and putting, so in advance of, of the completion of trials in parallel with trials, and um, which we did to a large extent, would have been nice to have done more, but we, we did to some extent, and putting in at very large scale is incredibly valuable. So our estimate is that the, you know, if you, that the last billion courses of annual capacity that have been installed that the global benefits of that are about $1.75 trillion. Or another way to think about that is what's the value per course of, uh, and it's one, 
$1,700, $1,750 is what we would estimate. Um, so the sooner this is available, the more it's worth. So having a billion doses of uh, or courses of annual capacity available today rather than six months from now, imagine we'd waited till, till the testing was finished before we started the construction process or started the, installing the capacity. Um, you know, that saved the world $1.2 trillion or almost $1,200 per course. So another finding, so our first, one of our first findings is the early investments we did were incredibly valuable from an economic perspective as well as a health perspective. But another conclusion is that even at this late stage, it's still worth investing more in capacity. So if we think about the world as a whole, and it's particularly true for the world as a whole, as opposed to just uh, for the US, you know, if the vaccines could be ready in, in, in uh, if we could get another billion doses of annual capacity, uh, if it would take three months to put that in place, which would be optimistic, um, they'd be worth um, 376 billion. But even if it took six months, it would still be worth 165 billion. So tremendous, it's worth, to society a vast amount to put in this additional capacity. Now, here's where the um, you know, standard issue in economics comes in, which is the social value of this is immense. The private value to a vaccine manufacturer is large, but much smaller. So if you think about the price of a course of vaccine, two doses, you know, that might be for the low cost vaccines, that's as little as $6, for higher costs, you know, $30, $40. Um, that's probably because there's social, you know, ethical constraints on pricing, implicit political constraints on, on pricing. But that's a decision society has to make. We're, we're, not, we're not saying that the, this should necessarily be priced at the social value. But in a setting where the social value is so much greater than the private value, the purely commercial incentives to do things that are you know, quite expensive to increase capacity or speed capacity and thus speed the time for vaccination don't reflect the full social benefits. And that suggests there's at least a case for governments and I think we would all support the idea that governments should try to procure that capacity, should try to uh, help pay for, for companies to put in that capacity. Um, and whether that's, you know, that's often actually a matter of repurposing things from existing purposes, not necessarily um, starting straight new construction. Um, so that's, that's our first set of conclusions. Second paper that I mentioned earlier is, uh, which is, is not yet ready to distribute, but I, I hope will be soon. Um, it's gonna be very important given that in the short run, since it takes so much time to put additional capacity in place, in the short run, we need to do everything we can to try to get more doses out of the existing capacity. And you know, there's several possibilities here and a little bit of analysis suggests there are potential huge benefits. Obviously, this is something where um, health professionals would need to be making the final decision on changing uh, the administration. Uh, to try to get more, more people vaccinated with the existing capacity. But um, some modeling suggests they're worth considering. So one approach is, is first doses first. So the UK is allowing up to three months between the first and second doses. And models suggest that will reduce infections and deaths by allowing more people to be vaccinated, even if the first dose isn't quite as effective as two doses. A second approach is a lower dosing reg regimen, especially for less vulnerable groups. That's another way to potentially increase the number of people vaccinated. And you know, just the logic of that is if you had half the dose to take an extreme, you could vaccinate potentially twice as many people. There's some evidence from Moderna and AstraZeneca suggesting you know, some possibilities that that could work. Obviously, this, is the, this, is, uh, this type of idea would have to be you know, subject to to medical decisions. And, but I think a key point here is if we want to have the option of doing this, the option of doing this could be incredibly valuable in terms of the number of additional people that could be vaccinated and the, the, health, the, the reductions in infections and mortality. 
to, to get that option, we need, we could learn, we could do things to learn and learn about whether this would work. So if we did large scale trials, um, we could compare the status quo approach to approaches of having a longer gap between the first and second dose or reducing the dosage. That people, if you were comparing the existing, the existing procedure to these modified procedures, I think there'd be lots of people who would sign up for such a trial. It wouldn't be a problem getting people to sign up and you could piggyback on existing distribution. You know, maybe you wouldn't do this for the highest priority people, but for, the, for, for somewhat lower priority people, you could, you could do this. Um, now, that's not necessarily gonna generate a lot of additional revenue for firms because you know, they're not gonna make more money if, the dose, if, if, the, if we give two doses with the, if we go with first doses first, for example. So we can't expect the firms to necessarily pay for this. It's another case where there's a difference between the social value of learning about this and the private value. So this, this may make sense for the government to support these types of, of trials. You know, other approaches to get more out of existing doses could include having, giving people opportunities to take uh, antibody tests to find out whether they've already been infected. And then to say, those who've been found not to have already been infected would be prioritized for early vaccination. Those who'd already been vaccinated might go further back in the queue and get vaccinated later. You know, uh, another element which might not be so relevant for the US, but it's relevant for many countries is there might be vaccines with different efficacies. Um, the, our, you know, some modeling um, suggests that the benefits from using um, a 70% effective vaccine that's available now are greater than those than waiting three months for a 95% effective vaccine. Um, let me say a, a few things from uh, an international perspective and then before um, handle it, handing this over to, to Susan. Um, you know, one, I'm, my, I've done a lot of work on vaccines, R&D, but um, I'm an economist who specializes in the economics of developing countries. And there was a lot of concern that uh, purchases by, like the ones the US did would have a negative effect on the rest of the world. Um, and I think some people clearly had a mental model where there was a fixed supply, a certain number, amount of capacity, the US buys up the doses, somebody else can't use it. I think what we've seen is that there's capacity is much greater than some people anticipated early on in the epidemic. So I think there's at least, I don't wanna write off those concerns altogether, but there's at least some, some ability to increase the amount of capacity. And if you do that, then if you write contracts appropriately, so you actually get capacity increased, that can not just have the negative effects that some people have focused on, but can potentially have positive effects in the long run, because if we get more global manufacturing capacity, that benefits the rest of the world. And at some level, if one country doubles its capacity, vaccinates their population half the time, that, that capacity then can move on to, to work in other countries. Now, obviously that, that depends on how fast, um, how much capacity can be put in place, I think, and depends on the nature of the contracts. One lesson, I think Susan will pick up on this again, is we want to make sure if there's another uh, pandemic in the future that we've got lots of capacity in place so we don't have a situation where um, moves by one country are going to, um, to hurt other countries, you know, uh, moves to increase capacity. Final thing I'll say on the international side, and I'll, I'll conclude here and turn it over to Susan, is the importance of setting up some mechanism for donation and for exchange of vaccines. So, you know, some countries you know, did took the sort of approach that that we had um, we were advocating of before we knew which vaccines were working, putting in orders so that many different companies would. Um, or multiple companies would uh, would would start building out the capacity. So they put in orders. In some cases, I think Canada is the extreme of this. Um, they actually now are entitled to many more doses than they'll need to, to vaccinate the population. So this is a situation where um, they'll be able to make some some donations down the road. And 
even the COVAX facility, which is purchasing on behalf of poor countries, also ordered multiple vaccines. Now, it's easier technically to administer just a, a single or a small number of vaccines. So um, part of our group is working on, working on thinking about how do you set up an exchange? And COVAX, uh, the international body, has announced it's planning to set up such an exchange. And that would allow countries to exchange, to get the type of, of vaccines they need and exchange with each other. But it would also create an opportunity for high-income countries that have bought vaccines in advance from multiple companies and that have excess doses uh, to donate them and for those doses to go where, they're, where they can have a, a tremendous impact. So certainly you know, hope that that will be taking place in the future. Um, when I turn it over to, to Susan to say a few words and then we can open up for questions. Great, thanks. <clears throat> um, so just a, a few more uh, topics. Um, one concern people might have about trying to you know, expand capacity is that maybe we can't absorb that capacity. And I think that's been the narrative for the last couple of weeks in the US that our, our capacity that we weren't able to deliver. But in the end, you know, Israel vaccinated 30% of its population in under four weeks. Um, and you know, the US, uh, we, we expect should be able to speed up substantially now that they're going and they've set up these large scale um, sites and that federal resources are available. And so it seems likely that vaccine production will be the limiting factor, not distribution um, in most places. Um, one month matters. So other countries should certainly learn from the US about you know, losing a few weeks uh, and where you're not vaccinating as fast as you can is, is, is costly. Um, but ultimately, when we're planning for these things, um, you know, it's the vaccines themselves are the limiting factor. Um, a second point, just to kind of flesh out a little bit more about, about contracting, in our, the paper that we sent you, we talked about how um, earlier in the pandemic, we were pushing uh, countries very hard to invest at risk, to, so to install the manufacturing capacity in advance of approvals. There are still things going through approval, so that uh, that analysis um, still matters now. And because of this huge social benefit, you know, investing at risk um, for something that even has a pretty low chance of success, if it accelerates vaccination of a country's population, that will be worthwhile. Um, now, we we also talk about how we want to contract on capacity rather than doses. So um, if, you, if you think about one example of a contract would be just give me 100 million doses by the end of March. And that's the way a lot of these things are, are talked about in the press. Now, we don't actually know exactly what the full contracts look like. And so there can be more behind the scenes. And in some cases, you get the idea that there, there, there is more behind the scenes, like the contracts are about specific production facilities. But in general, if you just say, deliver me a certain number of doses by a certain date, and you make that contract before approval, the company can make a smaller facility, stockpile doses in advance, still meet its delivery requirements, but then there, there won't be as much capacity left over for the rest of the world. If anything goes wrong in the timeline, you know, they, the, the pipe that's spitting out the vaccines is, is narrower, and if, if that smaller pipe is, is, is not as desirable from a social perspective. Another thing is that if you have a, a if you if you just contract for doses, a, country, a company doesn't face that much um, problem if they overpromise. So if they promise 100 million to one country and 100 million to another country, and there there's a setback, you know, well, who, everybody just has to wait longer. If they contract for one country first and then another country comes later, and then there's a setback. Um, then you know the country who contracted first won't won't get what they what they um, what was initially promised unless the contracts specify that more clearly. So if a country really um, specifies the amount of capacity that's getting built and that it will say get the first in lots off that capacity, they'll they can ensure that they will um, that the the company will actually do what it is that they want them to do and actually have enough capacity to serve the needs. Because in the end of the day, we don't have a lot of recourse. Um, you know, there, there's not enough vaccines in the world. And so, you know, if the, if the company hasn't built enough capacity, there's not that much we can do about it. Um, the, uh, so another um, point that we made was that um, 
in general, we, you know, in, in, in Michael's previous work, they had promoted advanced market commitments, which is sort of a, a market-wide um, commitment to, to pay uh, a premium for vaccines, and that would, that would induce people and induce firms to incur the development cost um, at, at, the, at the firm's risk. What we propose in this pandemic was, is, is more like direct procurement for the things that you know you want. Because the gap between the social benefits and, and, and the private cost is so large, um, it's, it's, easy, it's easier just to, to tell people what you want if you can observe it, like you can observe they build capacity. That's going to be a more direct way to make sure you get what you want. And in addition, um, the, the government bearing the risk is efficient um, given the, the, um, the large social value here. And an, another factor is that all the firms are different from one another. So some firms might have, you know, be fairly certain they're going to get across the finish line while other firms are higher risk. And so if you have, if you're trying to get lots and lots of firms to invest, a market-wide commitment didn't make as much sense because it would have to be really big to get the vaccines that were less sure that they were going to make it across the finish line to invest. So um, it could be very expensive and, and, and give too much profits um, to, to certain firms. So the, the firms that had a higher probability of success. So both from a cost perspective and just from a making sure you actually get what you need perspective, we, we, um, we advocated for uh, directly reimbursing capacity. Um, Michael already talked about another topic, which is super important, but I just really want to reiterate it. We need to keep learning and developing. Um, we're, we're mass vaccinating people. There's a bunch of people who want the vaccine who can't get it. This is a great opportunity to continue to learn and test. The pharmaceutical companies don't have the incentive to do that. In fact, they, there's a disincentive to do that. Um, and so um, we should be, the government should be playing a major role in figuring out uh, things like how long does immunity last? How good are vaccines at stopping transmission? Can you mix and match vaccines? How effective are lower doses? And we should be, you know, it, it would be pretty easy to send a set of people home after vaccination with rapid, rapid testing kits to accelerate our learning rather than just measuring symptoms like they did in some of the trials. Um, Another another point about learning, um, you know, we we need to um, keep and in, in development is we need to keep investing in mRNA. Um, we want the cost to come down. This this it, it's amazing that we got here. So many people early in the pandemic were skeptical about mRNA because it had never been done before. There are risks not just in safety and and efficacy, but also in manufacturing at scale. I mean, trying to manufacture you know hundreds of millions of doses of something that's never been done. Um, but the mRNA in general is very fast. And so once we now know that it can work and once we, we can build the manufacturing capacity, then it's going to be able to respond to mutations and things like that. It can, it, it can be applicable to other um, diseases in the future. So we um, suggest that we should, that, you know, investments in capacity from, for mRNA are, are not going to be wasted um, in any case. So, so there's, we should be scaling that up as much as possible. Um, in terms of preparing for the next pandemic, um, in general, we've seen every one thing after the other. You'd think we'd learn the first time, but it just as we roll from one issue to the next, you know, that we're, it, it can be hard to have enough supply quickly. You know, economics, you know, the market tends to work in the long run when prices can reflect value and when supply chains have a chance to adjust, but they're not very, they're, they, when, 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 there's a, when there's shortages, markets can get incredibly chaotic. Um, and so, you know, in general, if there's social constraints on, on pricing, there won't be enough supply. So we both see not enough supply, but also perhaps people being afraid to make, take big financial risks and create that supply um, because they're not sure if they'll be rewarded. Uh, and, and that uncertainty um, makes it hard, especially say you have a firm producing one thing, they're going to give up known profits and they don't really know for sure what the environment will look like by the time they are they 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 repurpose or whether they'll get financially rewarded for their for their costs. So we generally want to invest more in spare manufacturing capacity and supply chains. The the US already has programs to do this, but they were too small scale. And so we should we should make them larger. Um, Standardization also can make a big difference. Standardizing inputs like vials can reduce the cost of expanding capacity, especially at the time when you're at risk. You don't know which candidates will succeed, 
you don't know which candidates will have a manufacturing problem and have to shut down for a while. So the more the supply um, chain is interchangeable, the more we can um, shift around and make sure we don't slow down total output. Um, the uh, if we, and if we don't if we don't have enough capacity, there's there can be these prisoner dilemmas problems where people there's just a bidding war. One country is trying to use emergency authorization or something else to grab stuff for themselves, while if if we instead focus on building more capacity, when one country has more capacity, they get finished faster, um, and then that larger capacity is available to also vaccinate the rest of the world faster. So basically, if one country spends money on jumping to the top, top of the queue, that doesn't benefit the world as a whole. But if they spend money expanding capacity, they vaccinate themselves faster and the rest of the world. Um, last point, um, Biden's executive orders promoted investment in therapeutics as well. Um, I have a blog in Health Affairs that you can look at that laid out the need for that, outlining some of the failures we had in 2020, especially around coordinating clinical trials and also having the right government agencies to make those investments and what institutional changes would better prepare us. So he, the executive order was for the short term, but a lot of that could be expanded in the long term so that in the next pandemic, we are learning quickly, we are running the experiments so we know what works much faster.